Good afternoon and welcome to the Bob Woodruff Foundation Straight Talk webinar, Understanding and Elevating Board Governance for Your Organization. I'm pleased to see so many familiar faces joining us today. For everyone's awareness, please note that we are recording today's session. I'm Kelly Clark, Chief of Staff at the Bob Woodruff Foundation. For those who do not know the Bob Woodruff Foundation, our Got Your Six Network is the largest non-governmental network of organizations serving the military and veteran community. We're a thought leader, a funder, and when it's helpful to our community or when we're trying to understand thorny issues, we're a convener. Today's discussion is all about boards and board governance. We'll start by talking about the role of an effective board at a nonprofit organization. Then we'll do a deep dive on board recruitment and composition before closing with real examples of mitigating and overcoming challenges at the board level. Our panelists today are Colleen Egan, the CEO of Insight Housing in Berkeley, California, General Jack Hammond, the CEO of Home Base National Center of Excellence for Mental Health and Brain Injuries in Boston, Massachusetts, Margaret Middleton, the CEO of Columbus House out of New Haven, Connecticut, and Emily Bader, my colleague and the Senior Director for Investments at the Bob Woodruff Foundation. Thank you to all of our panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I'm thrilled to have you all here with us to learn more about board management and governance. For our audience, please note the box labeled Q&A at the bottom of the webinar screen. I encourage you all to enter any questions as they come up throughout the discussion. We'll reserve some time at the end to address your questions. Okay, so let's get started with the first part. We're gonna start with defining the board, the role of the board and the responsibilities of board members. Uh, Jack, I'd like to start with you. Home base has four different boards. Could you tell us about the role of each one and how your engagement with them differs? Really appreciate that question, Kelly. And I think it kind of cuts to one of the central points that everybody's probably interested in today is, is how do you have an effective board? And, and in some cases, you'll find that there are different needs that you need met. Um, and in our case, we found that to accomplish that and have something that was manageable, we actually needed to kind of spread this out into four separate boards. Um, for fiduciary responsibilities and financial oversight, we have our board of overseers, which in our case are two members of the Boston Red Sox leadership, president of the uh, uh, team, and then the, the president of Mass General Hospital and another leading official from Mass General Hospital. It's kind of a bicarmel organization that oversees this program. And so as they created the program, they decided to have equal shares and oversight and kind of watch this and develop it and uh, make strategic investments. They wanted a piece of that. Um, and so that, that, that that's actually quite manageable. Uh, and we meet twice a year. Um, we also have something that's very robust and we call it our leadership council. And we took a page from the various leadership elements within the Mass General Hospital which, you know, it's, it's a 200 plus year old organization that probably has a lot of chip teeth along the way and they've figured out how to uh, move this along. And so with our leadership um, council, um, they serve a very specific function where we, we that's comprised of uh, senior leaders, presidents of companies, CEOs of companies, as well as presidents or CEOs of organizations that uh, have, have can extend their influence or connect us to people. Um, one specific example of that is a gentleman by the name of Jim Brett, who is the CEO of the New England Council in Massachusetts, which is the umbrella lobbying group for every major business in all of New England. Um, and their access to legislators by way of you know, lobbying for Raytheon, Bank of America, Harvard, uh, UMass, um, they are a conduit for that already. So it's built in. And as a member organization with them and a partner, um, we're able to leverage relationships to connect to our, tele, uh, our our congressional delegation beyond just Massachusetts to all of New England. So it's, it's a great pathway. We have a similar arrangement with the Mass High Tech Council, which is the umbrella organization for all high tech businesses in Massachusetts. Um, and we're working with other organizations like the Mass uh, Bio, again, for the same reason, so that we can connect with their clientele uh, to find out if they'd be interested in participating with our organization. Um, the, the third group is a, um, uh, our red, white, and blue alliance. And, and if that, if you picture in your mind, mid-career folks, not the CEO level, but mid-career folks that are, you know, planning to go further, uh, a lot of companies that we've partnered with uh, look for opportunities for their mid-career leaders 
to get involved in philanthropy so that by the time they become senior executives, it isn't their first brush with working with philanthropies. Um, and what, what, what's great about these uh, young men and women is they have a lot of energy. Um, they, they've got a lot of con connectivity within the company. A lot of times they may be connected with one of the employee support groups. In our case, a lot of times they, they're with the veteran support group uh, within various companies. Um, and they have a couple of functions. Uh, number one, they, they work uh, to help uh, secure uh, funds for sponsorships, et cetera. Um, they also serve as a door opener to greater partnerships. Um, and then they, they also are, have an opportunity to bring volunteers to different events we do. So that's a pretty neat one. And then finally, we have an honorary board. And, and that, those are the folks that are very high profile, um, that may not have a lot of hands-on participation with you. Um, but for example, we have uh, Michelle Obama, Carolyn Kennedy, four Medal of Honor recipients. Um, we don't have a lot of contact with Michelle Obama. Uh, she has a lot of other irons in the fire. Uh, but when she was the first lady, she was very kind enough to lend her name to our honorary board, which gives you credibility. Um, having, you know, uh, several four-star generals, the former Surgeon General of the Army, uh, uh, head of the VA, all these great people, um, they kind of give you that sense of credibility when somebody looks at you as an organization to determine, you know, with, with, with the thousands of great organizations, there are some bad actors out there and nobody wants to align themselves with that. Uh, these honorary boards give you a great deal of credibility, uh, but there are also some super smart people um, that don't want the involvement of board meetings, et cetera, but they're open to phone calls for advice. And, and so many of these great people um, are a phone call away when I, you know, I have a question about, um, you know, Army Medical Command and how we can better support active duty soldiers. I can call um, uh, uh, General uh, Patty Horojo, who is former Surgeon General of the Army. Um, and for first female Surgeon General, first nurse Surgeon General, uh, great American, I can get some great advice from her. Um, so I think in, in a nutshell, you know, finding the right fit and finding people with kind of a diverse background uh, that, that can fit a need you have, sometimes you may need more than one. And that's fine because there's different levels of partnerships you can create. Thanks, Jack. Margaret, I wonder if you could take us a little bit deeper on the operations behind a governing board, um, and specifically if you could share some of the changes that you made when you joined the organization as the CEO after first being a board member yourself. Yeah, thanks, Kelly, and really honored to be here with this group today. Um, so I, I became the CEO of Columbus House in 2020, May of 2020, so we can all enjoy that uh, in retrospect. And I had served previously for nine years on the board. So I had some pretty strong ideas about how I thought we could improve um, the board. A lot of those had to do with the actual functioning of the board. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of sort of operational changes to how the board worked, we really wanted to maximize. And I was really doing this with my board peer and the board vice chair who were like, providing, you know, we were sort of co-leading this effort to reform the, the board and the way it functioned. We really wanted to make sure that we were making the best possible use of board's time. They're there because they're involved, um, smart, connected community members. And so we want to use their time talking about tough questions and making decisions. And um, we call that having the red meat of the meeting, which I'm a like basically a vegan, so we should probably rename it. But um, you know, really trying to put the decision making and the thinking up front, making sure people have the materials that they need to do that. So um, reporting out of committees, which had been most of what the meetings were before, has been banned. Like your committee can report out if it has something that everybody needs to know, but if it's just that the finances are fine, then um, a paper report attached will do. You know, or any you know an electronic report will do. Um, a lot of the work is getting pushed to committees. So the board itself doesn't need to have a brainstorming session about possible candidates. The, you know, the governance committee, which does recruiting can have that conversation and bring it back to the board. Like having the committees do the homework and bring it back to the board for the like bigger picture of the decision making. Um, I cut down on the meeting frequency. We were meeting every single month when I was on the board. We just had months where we didn't need to have a meeting and that's not a good use of people's time. I'm just really careful about the use of people's time and trying to make the best use of it. Um, we increased educational opportunities for the board. What I learned working at Columbus House is that when I was on the board of Columbus House, I did not know 
what we were doing. I didn't know the scope of it. I didn't understand it the way that it became very clear to me, um, even after nine years on the board. So we've really increased, like we have four educational sessions a year for the board where they hear from people who are outside of the board in our sector, or they hear from people within our organization who they might not have met before. We get clients in front of them to talk about what they're experiencing right now in our programs. Um, we gave them a bus tour because we have properties that we've acquired over the years that members of our board have never seen because they're in a different town and they just have never gone. Um, so that's really it in terms of like the sort of functioning. We also made some changes to the composition of the board for the first time we added people with lived experience of homelessness um, to the board. And I think a really critical way we did that was by changing the recruiting pattern. So depending on the board to nominate other board members means that you get a board that looks and sounds and thinks a lot like the board you have. And so we really relied on staff and community members to, to give us names of people who we wouldn't otherwise have met, which led to some great um, additions to our board. And then the final change I would say is I really insisted that we do more handholding of board members, more spoon feeding, if you will, when it comes to advocacy. So getting them in front of legislators, getting them to make their call to their legislator, getting them to send the email, um, and also more accountability. So instead of sending out an email that says, hey, I hope you'll call your legislator and say this, and send out an email that says, here's the script. I've already sent you who your legislator is and their phone number. Please hit reply all. Kayleen, Kayleen, is it Kayleen is laughing at me, but I do this. Please hit reply all when you've done it. And there's a peer support mechanism built in that people see that other people are doing it. And do I get 100% board participation? No, we're close. But do I get twice as many people as I might have or even three times as many people as I might have? Definitely. Um, and I've heard that from them. Like they are you know, they do appreciate the sort of handholding. And similarly with development, there's more handholding because similarly to advocacy, board members in their day-to-day -day life don't think of themselves as fundraisers. They don't understand what fundraising is. And so I'm really trying to make it like, I'm not asking you to call this person and ask them for money. I'm asking, do you know anyone who works at that company? Like, do you have anybody on your kid's t-ball team? that their kids, like their parents um, live in that neighborhood. Like we're just looking to make a connection between this agency and them, or we're looking to strengthen the connection. It's all about that relationship. And so we will literally like in the meeting march through, here's all the like potential sponsors we have for this event. And it's a much more like grassrootsy community-based effort than what Jack is describing clearly. But um you know, that level of sort of like supporting them and doing it and not just assuming that we can hand a board member a task and then they're going to go off and do it. Because the reality is like the time that they're giving to the agency is almost exclusively the time that they're with us. Like anything that they do on top of that is going to be, we're not sure. Like we're not sure if it's going to happen. We don't know. And so really trying to make like as much of it happen as a collective, like visible effort as we can. Pauline, I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I know Insight Housing also prioritizes having lived experience on your board. Could, could you double down on that and talk a little bit about how that impacts your, your programs and operations? Margaret, I couldn't agree with you more on the reply all function within emails to the board. A very effective tool. <laughs> so <laughs> I was laughing in solidarity with you. Um, <laughs> yes, so having people with lived experience on your board, they are truly the experts in how we're going to end homelessness. And they have a lens and a perspective that is invaluable to your organization. So thinking about accessibility, when we're talking about bringing on new programs or building new buildings, Things, their lens and their thought of how, how can we get more people access to these programs or how are we designing this building so that it can age in place with seniors or it is conducive to the needs that are we're currently seeing. Um, and currently within our board, we do have a veteran who has lived experience and we are looking to bring on another veteran as well because it has brought, um, it's just brought such a different perspective. And to Margaret's other point about if you only lean on board members to bring on more board members, you're going to get one specific board. So really outreaching to other um other places within the community, within your team, within whom you serve, 
can only strengthen your agency. I will also add too, when thinking about, um, you know, considering bringing people with lived experience onto the board, it it brings a level to, of enhancing their own their own power and confidence as well, and whom they can affect too. So it's overall 100% supported by us and very much um, has enhanced our agency and what we've been able to accomplish. Emily, can you provide a little context from the funder's perspective and what we look for at the Bob Woodruff Foundation about boards when you're reviewing grant applications? Sure. So it's a, a lot of the things that Colleen, Jack, and Margaret have already mentioned. So I would say the first thing that we're looking for, um, I always want to see a connection to the mission. So especially for grant seekers who are coming into the Bob Woodruff Foundation, I want to see that the board reflects at least some current or prior military exposure, whether that is they themselves having served or that they've worked with a military connected organization or professionals in their career. Um, another thing we definitely are interested in seeing is as an organization has grown, have they made that transition from kind of a friends and family type of board to really intentional recruitment of board members that can help them build out more robust governance capabilities? Um, we are reviewing sometimes up to 500 grant applications in a year. So it really stands out when we see organizations that are smaller, really making those intentional decisions to bring in professionals that can help them grow to that next level. Um, another thing that we're looking at, and I think Jack, what you what you all are doing at home base is great because what we are kind of exploring as we're looking at boards is, is everyone an entry level professional? Is there some C-suite representation? So the thought of having kind of that junior board is a great opportunity to bring people in who are maybe more of the middle manager level as they're you know, getting exposed to your organization as they grow in their career. Um, I'll leave kind of two, two more things. So another big consideration is uh, board diversity and representation. So as um, Margaret and Colleen hit on, it's always great to have, you know, someone with lived experience, um, especially if it's a prior program participant, that insight that they have having, you know, had that direct connection with your organization is going to be really insightful for you as, as a leader and also for your board to hear at that board meeting. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, a board is, is only as effective as they are engaged in your work. So we're really asking applicants, you know, how often do you convene? Are you recording board minutes? Um, and really making sure that it's not just a, a symbolic board, but it's an actively engaged one. And if there's if there's anyone on here who is a program that kind of lives within a kind of larger medical system or university system, I'd really encourage you to think about how you can come up with your own advisory boards so you can benefit from that insight and advice, even if you are under the larger board of that institution. Thanks, Emily. So we've talked about what a great board looks like hypothetically. Um, for all of our panelists, would you be willing to share some stories um, in, in any order is fine, of how board recruitment actually happens. What are the steps that you take? How do you get this diverse board with a range of experiences um, who's really enthusiastic and, and involved in your mission? I'm happy to jump in. I, I, I would tell you, you know, the, there's a couple stages of it. And as, as you become, um, your organization becomes more mature, um, you make less mistakes. And, and, and when I say mistakes, uh, th there's a tendency for board, uh, for nonprofits when they first form is to take anybody that will join and be your board. You, I mean, you really get, you're struggling. You're trying to get something going. If they've got a big name, you want to pull them in and say, hey, would you be on the board? I, I would tell you, number one, we, you know, and that happens. It just, it's just it's a fact of life. It just happens because you're eager, you're, you're, you know, and, and frankly, if you don't know better, you, you, you can't do better. And the more you know, the better you know. And um, I, I'd say being selective. Right. And, and, and making sure that, number one, that person fills a need and whether it's time, treasure or talent, um, there's something they need to be able to add value to your organization for and vice versa. There's got to be um, managed expectations on what they get from this personally. And when I say that, it's got to be rewarding to them. Um, all too often, I, um, one of the boards I inherited when we first got here 
was an expectation that they were almost like a board of directors when that is not, they had no fiduciary control um, and they weren't going to steer the direction of the organization because that was my board of overseers and, and myself and key leaders. Uh, and so there was some frustration because really why they were brought on initially was our development team kind of pulled them together as big potential donors. And, and so when you have misaligned expectations, you can create friction points because they believe they're being brought in for senior level advisory roles uh, when in fact they're really looking to them for significant donor support. Um, there is a great happy medium and that's what we've been able to find is if you find, and that's the goal, right? If you find somebody that can provide you with good strategic counsel and advice that also has access to opening doors to connect you with the resources you need to accomplish your mission, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful scenario. Uh, and, and not all of them are able to financially write a big check, but they may just be one of these strategic people that can make all the right connections for you that, that lead to success. Um, and, and so um, anyway, as you look at the board members and you start picking them, developing board members with complementary skills. Um, I think someone mentioned a moment ago, you don't want a like-minded board that everybody knows the same stuff. You, you want a diverse board that brings a range of perspectives. Uh, comes at this from a different, uh, many different vantage points because you get a 360 degree view of everything. And it's not a very myopic look through a telescope. Um, and, and when you have complement, complementary skills, um, you might have somebody that has great media experience and they can connect you uh, and advise you on how to do your marketing strategy, et cetera. You may have folks that are, are very business oriented or medically, you know, doctors with a very perspective, strong perspective on how to deliver and innovate on medicine and they can, you can kind of lean on them a bit. Um, so I'll, I'll just offer those and take a step back for a moment. I know there's other great ideas. I 100% agree with everything you just said, Jack. And I will just add that for, for Insight Housing, we're operational in seven Northern California counties. So ensuring that there is representation from all of those communities is very important. Um, we haven't been 100% successful in doing that just because of how um, stretched out and the distance in between those communities are, but it is definitely a set goal of ours um, to do. So something also to consider that if you are operational in various different um, communities to make sure that there is representation so that when you are once again making those big decisions on how programs might be shaped or formed or um, executed within, it will be very impactful to have that perspective on the board. I can probably add something. I mean, I think you guys have named great strategies for finding good board members. Um, I would say this is a really basic reformulation of what Emily said, but somebody who has demonstrated interest, not just that they say that they have interest, but they have demonstrated interest. And I'll just give you an example. Um, I have a neighbor who happens to be um, quite senior at the Travelers. And when I moved back into town to take this job, he said, hey, I was just reading your 990. And I was like, my board meeting is on Monday. Like if you're reading my 990, that's already demonstrated like a willingness to dig into what's happening here in a way that's like exactly what I need board members to do, right? Um, and he's my vice chair now. I mean, he's doing a great job. So that kind of demonstrated interest, which you might find through volunteers. We found a great board meeting member going to a zoning meeting about one of our projects and listening to somebody speak really passionately about the importance of affordable housing in her neighborhood. And we're like, can I get your number, please? Because the way she spoke was so moving and um, we didn't otherwise know her. The other thing I will mention is like what has made for really bad, uh, bad board relationship or, you know, memberships that didn't work out. Um, and that was really doing recruiting where we didn't put the mission at the center of the recruiting. So when we were trying to make a more diverse board by adding members with lived experience or members from certain ethnic groups or members with certain expertise where we were sort of like, we're gonna go out and get this person and recruit them to the board, did not work because we weren't putting the mission at the center. The reality is there are people with lived experience from all kinds of neighborhoods, from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds that care about your mission a ton. And so it's about finding those people and recruiting them. So having like a broad view of who the universe of people that care about your mission are, as opposed to thinking like, I need somebody with press experience. Who do I know? Can I convince them to care about homelessness? 
Margaret, let's stay with you for a second. So we just talked about obviously the beginning of a board member's tenure with recruitment. What do you do to stay engaged or do you stay engaged with board members when their term limits end? I just had this conversation with my board chair because he comes off at the end of the year and I was like, I'm not ready for this. And he said, you know, I'll come back on. It's a best practice. He knows, right? He's been on other boards. It's like, it's a best practice. You need fresh blood. You need people to turn over. And he's like, if you want me back in three years, like, talk to me. I'm definitely going to be here. And we absolutely stay in touch. So we have, for example, a past chairperson of the board still serves on the finance committee. He calls every single donor under $100 who's new, which is like a huge number of people and something that no other board member would do. And he's not a board member, right? He doesn't have to come to all the meetings. He's 50% of the time he's calling us from Key West or he's coming into the finance committee, but he has a huge amount of institutional knowledge. So um, anything, any like, you know, less intense role that we can maintain um, and making sure that these former board members get invited to the fun stuff, right? Because they put in the time, but like, are they coming to the parties? Are they coming to the celebrations? Are they invited when there's, you know, a going away party because they feel really connected. And so it's really, it's a relationship um, at that point. I don't find I have to do anything special because they're already so ingrained that they're just like a part of the family and you just do that kind of outreach to them because you care about them. I can add to that, that we have officially started an alumni board um, that officially came into play. We introduced term limits last year. So we had three very long time board members terming off on June 30th. One was also the previous board chair. I, I know how that feels. Um, <laughs> and so it's a very active alumni board. Our first meeting is scheduled, or not our, our first for this fiscal year is scheduled September 20th, but they're intentional. They're ahead of our big um, cultivation or fundraising events, making sure exactly how Margaret said, getting them to the fun, the fun pot stuff because they've already put in the time, but keeping them connected to, to what we do and our growth and our successes. So I think, keeping previous board members in the conversation is absolutely best practice. And I can also just share from my experience that once they're off the board, it's almost like this relationship shifts. Like I FaceTime with a, our previous board president now, just randomly, he'll just FaceTime me. Hey, I'm walking here. Do you want to meet up and get coffee? So it's really shifted our relationship. And it's also been able to sort of relax the conversation to have even more difficult conversations sometimes. So very much encourage it. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit now about the the difference between you working with your board for advice and when you need to get formal approval from the board and how that looks and how you how you make those distinctions as the CEO on you know an ongoing basis. Um, Jack, could we maybe start with you to help help understand what are the decisions that you are making, you know, at your level, perhaps talking to advisors, but versus when you really feel you need the board's approval and buy-in to move forward on something? So that, that that's a really tremendous question. And I think probably for the first year or two, um, I didn't know where that ground was and what their comfort level was. And so I had to get, I think you have to figure that out. I think that's one of those things that there isn't a hard, fast answer because um, I can tell you that the, 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 um, the feelings of the board shifted after the first year or two uh, and they became more relaxed. And, and what I would tell you is um, we had some budget growth at home base. We had some program growth. Um, and when I first got there, um, there was some dedicated funding from each of the partners for the first three years that carried most of the program. I didn't realize when I arrived at year four, that stopped. And so we were flying without a net. Um, and they were rightfully concerned that, you know, we'd be able to sustain ourselves. Otherwise, they've got to go back to giving direct funding when they wanted to shift their role to assisting us in raising the money, but not writing direct checks anymore. Um, and so my two parent organizations, the Red Sox and Mass General. And so the Red Sox were very happy to help us raise the money. They just didn't want to write a check every year. And Mass General provided us with a development team at no cost. And that was their ongoing gift. So they did, but they didn't want to have to take us into receivership and pay our bills for us. Um, and so for my first year, they they were very hands on, um, and our most of the uh, any type of major decision really had to be run by them um, because of the financial implications. And that was that was really the driver. Um, within two three years, we were very uh, we were financially stable. Um, and, and frankly, what I did was brief them our strategy moving forward. 
and I got permission. Uh, I got approval, board approval for the strategy. And so once they got the buy-in, I, I kind of laid the building blocks of what the key goals and objectives would be within the strategy. Um, I would give them a notification that we're at that decision point. We're going to be moving forward, barring any concerns. And so I would just let them know we were moving forward because the strategy was approved. And, and I, I didn't, that, that's why they pay me is to manage the day-to-day. Um, and so as long as the strategy is approved um, and they knew the approximate costs associated with it, I would let them know before we made the final decision to implement it as a, as a more of a courtesy. Uh, and occasionally I'd get a call and, you know, it'd be like, are you sure we got the funding? We're good. Yep. Okay. I just wanted to double check. Um, so I didn't have to go back and seek formal approval because I got it with, by way of strategy uh, with very, you know, specific strategic goals laid out. So I, I think that will help you. Uh, the other part is you, you, you got to be financially solvent. And, and, and by, by over time, when you demonstrate um, you have good fiduciary control of the organization, their confidence in you, you know, is less concerning about, you know, other resources in place to do this. They know I've already done the due diligence on that. Thank you. Colleen, would you be willing to share the process that you went through with your recent name change and what that looked like working between your team and the board throughout? Absolutely. Um, and I couldn't agree with Jack Moore. It does. It absolutely takes a couple years to build <laughs> that board confidence and financial strength is also always a plus in doing so. Um, for our name change, it has been over a decade in the making. We expanded our previous name was Berkeley Food and Housing Project, and we expanded outside of Berkeley in 2013. Um, and so when I took over this role in 2019, we had a, a few other priorities at, at hand um, before changing our name. And so at the end of 2021, it did resurface with the board. And, you know, this was something that they wanted to prioritize. It was also part of our strategic plan as well. And so we had two different teams, our senior leadership team, along with our board, that would go back and forth in identifying this rebrand, identifying what the name change would be. We also held several focus groups with all of our different stakeholders, including our participants, our funders, um, donors, community members, because we really wanted our new name to encompass what Berkeley Food and Housing Project was. So literally just taking off the name and putting on a new one, kind of like a Band-Aid, but not really. And so <laughs> when we finally drilled down to a name um, and presented it to the board for a vote, um, the first round was not well received. And so we had to go back to our chalkboard to figure out, well, how are we gonna take this across the finish line? Because our intention was to have a new name by January 1st of 2023 and reveal it on May 4th, 2023 at our fundraising event. And so I um, decided, you know, let's really get the team's buy-in in this. So we surveyed our entire staff to see what name they would pick. We had surveyed them several different times, free burritos all around. I don't know how many times those went, but gets people to participate in those surveys, right? So the final survey went out and it came back that Insight Housing was the top choice. And so we went back to the board and I pretty much told them, you know, what the team wants, the team gets, because these are your number one ambassadors for this new name. They are out there every day with their Insight Housing t-shirts or hats or vests. They are who live and breathe our mission every day and work with our participants. So it is very important that we choose a name that they believe in. And that evening, the board did vote on Insight Housing, so we were able to move forward with our name change from May 4th, which we revealed it that evening, and we literally pressed a button, and everything changed. Website, email signatures, business cards. I mean, we were working around the clock up to this date, but it was it was successful. And um, it was, but it was definitely an experience of getting the board and the team on the same page and really getting the board to see it through the team's lens. And I can also um, just say that, you know, for a board member who does have lived experience, his perspective on this was the meaning of the name. What does insight mean? And how that is going to be um, recepted to whom we're trying to serve. So it was very, it was, it was an, it was a very intense process, but at the end of the day, reflecting on it, it was actually 
one of the best exercises we've ever done together because we were able to come out of it on the same page and with a new name. Thanks, Colleen. I'd like to switch just one more time to a new topic before we open up for Q&A from the audience um, and focus on mitigating risks and overcoming challenges that come through at the board level. Um, Emily, I'll start with you to talk about the risks a nonprofit can face that a board might be able to help mitigate. Um, and then for the rest of the panelists, I'd love to hear some of your good news and bad news stories, examples of um, challenges that have either come up uh, through the organization that you've taken to the board or that have originated within the board that you've had to manage. Um, so Emily, let's start with you. Sure. So I would say from the partners that we've funded in the past, they've really been successful mitigating challenges by involving their board. So they've involved their board in planning, in resource allocation, in legal and financial oversight, all of these functions that are really preventative. Um, of course, resource allocation is, is a big challenge, right? So many of the organizations within this space are fundraising for their operating expenses every single year. So an effective board can really help your organization think through your budget and your strategic priorities for that year. Um, I think, Jack, you also mentioned door openers, having board members who can open doors that are not just um, financial, so it's not just connections to donors, but also um, other professional services can be really helpful. You know, having somebody who has a connection to an attorney when your organization needs legal assistance can be really beneficial. Um, I think another great uh, risk mitigation tool is having your board be that check on mission drift. You know, there are so many needs in this community we're all mission to serve, uh, but your organization can't do everything right? Nor should you. So I think your board can be a really good check on making sure that your organization is staying true to your role in that, in this space, um, especially when it comes to taking on restricted funding. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times organizations have to have really difficult conversations about if restricted funding from donors really makes sense for their organization. So your board can help you kind of have that difficult conversation and also help you have conversations with donors that you have accepted the funding from, and maybe it's not going quite the way you anticipated. So they can be a really helpful backup uh, on those. Then I think the, the last thing I'll say is, um, I think you know the other panelists talked about thinking through expertise. Um, board members who have a real experience working in your subject matter. So someone who has mental health background, if your organization's working in mental health, can really help you think about if certain new initiatives are a good fit or not. So consider you know, who your organization can recruit that will be able to really be an informed voice for you. Thanks, Emily. And for everyone else, um, as you're thinking about your, your maybe bad news stories um, or examples from the board. One of the specific questions that came through the chat is how do you approach board trustees who are not carrying their weight, e.g. meeting participation, committee participation? Um, Margaret, you're nodding. Can we start with you? Yeah, in fact, when you asked the question, that's what I had written down. Um, I think the way, in my experience, to deal with that is in advance. And it's by having two things. One is an expectation, like written expectations um, that you go over with potential board members. And then with new board members, it's like a signed document that says, I understand that joining this board means this um, to this organization. So one is that. And the other is having in the bylaws a clear path to asking somebody to leave the board. And um, for example, at my organization, if you miss three meetings in a row, I, you know, we have that we, we we have the option of asking somebody to step down from the board, and um, that's just a really, you know, essential thing because it takes some of the personal conflict out of it. It's like if the board chair saying to somebody, "Hey, we have this policy in our bylaws, and you may, you know, you've run afoul of that. Is there something that we need to do to?" get you to more meetings or, you know, meeting participation is one example. Um, but the bylaws only matter when you absolutely need them. So you want to actually have them be good because they're your like emergency plan. Like they're your like rip off the like thing and they're going to like blow up into a lifeboat and save you kind of thing. Um, and so that's, that's a clause you have to have in there. I, I would just echo what Margaret said. I, I think 
um, managing expectations is a huge piece of this and setting things up front. I mentioned, you know, earlier that, you know, when you first start, you chip a few teeth. We, di we didn't do that. Um, and we brought a lot of people in and our, our, our expectations weren't aligned with theirs. Um, and we did have some people atrophy in their participation. Um, we, we actually just went through a whole overhaul last year um, with all of the groups one at a time um, where we reaffirmed membership um, with everybody, frankly, we needed, wanted, and was participating. And then we thanked and sent a parting gift to folks that hadn't been meeting expectations. Um, and so, you know, there was no, you know, we, we don't, we, we explained to them that they had actually exceeded their board time um, and that we thanked them for everything that they did and told them we hope they still stay involved with our program. Um, but for those who are actively, and we knew we had one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, and then this time around, we put very strict timelines. This will be for three years. So now everybody has a chance to either stay or, transition um, and you can kind of keep that going. Yeah, I want to just point out that Jack just mentioned term limits and then Kelly already mentioned term limits and that I should have mentioned term limits because a lot of especially new nonprofits don't put in term limits and you're going to wish you had term limits because there are people who are only okay board members and you're glad that they were there and then at the end of their term it's okay that they go on and it gives everybody a graceful opportunity for that relationship to transition into something else. Okay, before we go to the rest of the Q&A, is there anything that any of our panelists would like to like to add? Any advice that you have on board governance that we haven't talked about yet today? If I could just uh, offer one, that, one more thing. You mentioned uh, almost like a bad risk story where the board kind of came into play. Um, 2019, in the fall of 2019, uh, we did our traditional uh, Leadership Council board meeting. And we, we had just come off a capital campaign where we built a brand new national center we tripled the size of the program. We kind of tripled our budget and we're feeling really good about everything. Um, one of our board members um, is a venture capital guy. He manages a, a, a major Ivy League endowment in the billions. And he's just a super smart business person. And at the end of the meeting, uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, I, I see a downturn coming. Now, this is 2019, no idea about COVID, but he just saw some other numbers with all the stuff he does in the private sector. And he said, are you guys in good shape? And boy, my blood went cold. And I, I said, I, I think so. Um, but we did, we did a complete top to bottom uh, financial wellness check um, throughout the entire organization. We found some programs that had atrophied that really weren't delivering that we were just kind of keeping them going because we'd been doing them for a while. Um, we made some cuts. Um, we repurposed people into programs that needed growth. We stopped hire, basically implemented our own hiring freeze. Um, and we took a lot of steps um, that you would take after you get bad news. But we did it early because we, we wanted to just see where we were coming out of that growth spurt. And that was a good, healthy thing to do anyway. And then we all know the story in February 2020, uh, when everything shut down, we had already gone through that process and, and, and it was no keen insight on my part. It was just an alert board member with a very unique skill set that called attention to something he saw coming, which was just enough for us to do a well check on our own financial situation, our, our organizational health. Uh, and we were able to make a lot of very uh, important decisions that paid off literally three, four months later. Um, and, and so having that, that board composition with a broad range of skills and that open communication with them where they feel comfortable, you know, outside of regular business, um, just to share their thoughts and insight. Um, and, and people matter if you have the right people and you're comfortable with them versus someone that may not be as skilled that's just popping off. Cause you know, I, we've, I've dealt with that too, that people with no experience in something sharing their just thought of the day. Um, and in those cases, you know, that that's not healthy, but, but, um, and, and that's when you start looking at off ramping folks, et cetera. But in this case, it was, a, it, it was, a, it was a game changer for us because when COVID hit, we were very financially resilient, um, and came into that, that, that really, um, uh, challenging period, very healthy. So I, I'll just leave it at that. I only got one thing, Kelly, which is that, um, I was the co-founder of a tiny little nonprofit, right? And I know that some people who are 
participating in this webinar today probably are also. I joined the board of the organization where I now am like a year or two into that. And I think board service is a great way to understand how to have a better board because you really understand, like you're volunteering your time and you understand sort of what does this feel like from that perspective? And so I always encourage people who want to be CEOs and have a board to go join a board, even if it's a very different kind of organization, no matter what, like board governance is, you know, board governance to some extent. Margaret, do you have any other advice um, besides joining a board? Oh, that's a great one. One of the questions that came in is, um, what growth advice and governance advice would you have for nonprofits that are mostly volunteer-led? I would, I would say flexibility, um, being nimble, being able to pivot, and having the mindset of this is, this is just because you know this might be what the bylaws say, or this is the way we currently do things, or have set the structure to do it. Um, always thinking like, well, maybe we need to shift that to better meet our agency's needs. Um, I, I can tell you we're, I'm four and a half years in, into this position. We've, we've grown significantly since um, I've been in this position and I'm constantly reevaluating how we're engaging the board and some of the, um, the tactics that Margaret was describing are, are very helpful, but I think just having that mindset and flexibility will be very useful, um, especially since most, most nonprofit boards are volunteer boards. And so that engagement piece, like Margaret, I think you said it so well, if you know, they're not with you in that moment and they're, you know, where living their lives in their careers or with their families, then what is their engagement at that point? So always sort of having that mindset about board engagement, about flexibility um, can only be helpful to you as you're trying to grow your organization. So we have someone joining us today who is an incoming board chair and this will be their first time in that role. What advice do you all have for them? Well, one thing I would say is it's a, it's a difficult task. I mean, you're coming in, you've got an organization to kind of lead, um, but then you, you have this other thing out there that you've got to manage um, because that's a partnership that you can't um, let fall to the wayside while you're pursuing your, um, your, your personal goals. Um, one of the things I've done in every new organization that I've come to where I have somebody I report to, um, to, to get the communication going and keep it going and, and, and be time efficient and respectful of everybody's uh, personal time, I used to start doing a um, biweekly email just to give them some a quick update. And then in that email, I would identify no more than three issues or concerns that we were working on. And all of this was for situational awareness. Focused on these are the three concerns we're working on that we're finding a little challenging, but we're going to you know, find a way forward, et cetera. Um, and just keeping that communication open so there are no surprises, so you don't get to a board meeting, especially early on in the relationship where you haven't got that trust built yet. Um, you're able to achieve that through open communication. And then as things develop further and further, um, you know, if there's an area that they do have a particular concern on that note, they, you'll get a call. And, and, but it's a personal call. It's a, it's a less formal call and they'll say, hey, tell me more about that thing. And, and they may offer some great advice. Or they, might, they may offer some support and say, I know a person that can help you with that. Um, so, and that, that's leveraging your board in a good way. So that's not all, you know, that less formal structured relationship. Uh, so I, I think that to me is, is probably the best way. Uh, the other piece is if you, if you have the ability, make sure you have a, a dedicated staff member responsible for care and feeding of your board. Um, you have way too many things to stay on top of, and you don't want to be a single point of failure with board management. If you have a, a primary staff person that is responsible for making sure that you are regularly connecting with them, that they're getting newsletters, they're getting their, their addresses are up to date, phone call periodically, check in and make sure they're all set for the meetings. Um, one person dedicated to that board is, is extremely helpful uh, because if they have a handle on it, a lot of times they can ask, you know, there can be some side communication where the board members don't want to bother you, but there's something going on or they may not be able to make it. They don't have to deal with you and, and tie you up with a series of emails. Uh, the board management person um, can help you with that. Uh, we found that very successful. 
I would also just throw out, it's really helpful when board chairs know the other board members well. Um, understanding what they can bring to the board, how to leverage some of the connections they might have. Um, also knowing what particular committees they may benefit from being involved in can be really helpful. Thank you all. One more question, and this one's, this one's pretty practical. Many funders ask for information regarding the diversity of board members. How do you approach directors to provide personal information? We typically just ask. <laughs> um, we also have, we have, um, after, you know, we've gone through our process and you're, you've been voted on to the board, we do have paperwork that does ask several questions too, but in sort of our process of on board or board candidacy, um, a lot of those questions do surface. It's like, you know, we're getting to know you, you're getting to know us. And so, you know, really trying to diversify a board, you're looking for certain skill sets, you're looking for, I mentioned, you know, we're looking for geographic representation. So that's when I think you can really feel okay to be asking those, those questions. We've seen organizations that just develop kind of a board, perspective board member sheet where there is a variety of questions about their current or prior affiliations and personal information. And then it's just something that they can provide to prospective board members that is completely consistent and feels like a natural introduction to some of their background. Okay, another one, do boards have their own budgets? How do you handle things like expenditures for board trainings or meetings? I mean, just for perspective, we're about 15 million a year and we essentially have no budget for the board. Um, Myself, my executive assistant, our time is pretty much the thing that manages the board. So as much as we would love to have a dedicated person, that's a total dream. Uh, and then we do have, you know, what we provide in terms of sort of like bells and whistles is not, not a ton. Um, but we put, we have a general kind of meeting line in our budget. And so to the extent that we're having is like, a meeting that's out in the community and there's going to be food and stuff it can slot into that line but it's not it's not specific to the board and we do not spend a lot of money on the board and i have to say i think the board given like sort of our financial position the like difficult nature of the work that we're in i don't think the board would want to see us spending a lot of money on the board because they're donors um and they know a lot about the financial position so we don't, you know, we don't have any, we don't get any complaints really about, about that. I would agree. Uh, very little, um, other than swag, we always make sure they're well equipped with swag. We want them wearing our stuff and they love it. Um, we give them a gift once a year. It's like a thank you for wasting money on that because they are donors as well. Um, and it's frankly, you know, refreshments for meetings, but we don't pay travel transportation, any of that. Um, at, you know, we know that they're financially solvent enough that that travel to us is not an issue. It's part of what they do. Well, thank you all so much for coming up on time. So a big thank you to our panelists uh, for all of your insights today, as well as everyone who attended to understand more about building and cultivating effective boards. Um, we'll be sending out an email with the link to this recording soon. Please do share it with your colleagues and anyone else who you think might benefit from this information. Thanks very much, everyone.